Uh, you can't have a multitude of gods in your life, and God insists on that. One God, that's part of our Ten Commandments. And I think about what I said last week. Many people think that they're not relevant anymore. The Ten Commandments are archaic. And you remember what uh, Turner said? He said, nobody wants to obey rules or commands. Well, it doesn't make any difference what we want. That's what God intends, and that's what he wants for us. And I want you to look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24 again. We saw this last week. Oh, i got to have a microphone. All right, where is it at? Is it on now? Is it on now? Okay. Anyway, we talked about this last week. In Galatians 3.24, we saw this. It says, Wherefore, the law, which is the Ten Commandments, was our what? schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now I think about in the New Testament it describes that it's the schoolmaster leading people unto the Lord, but the Ten Commandments are more than that. They are our instructor. They still, for our life, it sets a standard for you and I to live in this life. And we need to remember that. Sometimes we think, well, the Ten Commandments, that's Old Testament. We don't need it today. If you'll down and you'll read the Ten Commandments, do it on a regular basis, it'll open our eyes to the fact of how we need to live. It does. Boy, it's quiet in here tonight. Is anybody here? Amen. All right. Uh, anyway, to be what we ought to be as a Christian will depend on what we or who we make number one in our life. I think about over the years as the struggles in my life. When I have a struggle, it's because I didn't put God number one. Amen. And if you have a struggle in your life and you profess to be saved, the problem you have is the exact same thing. It's because we don't put the Lord number one in our life. And I think about if, if God is not number one on our life, it's like our, our life will be out of balance. It's like a car. If you have your front wheels on a car and they're not balanced, and they're not what they're supposed to be, what does that car do going down the road? It wobbles, it shakes, and you know what it can end up in? It can end up in disaster. And I think it's the exact same thing with you and I. If we do not put the Lord, number one, and He is the only God in our life, our life will be out of control, and it very well can end up in disaster. I mean, everybody in here tonight, you know somebody that had professed to be saved, been in church, maybe for a long time, but all of a sudden they got backslidden, they quit living for God, and the next thing you know, they were nowhere to be found. Amen. And that's a fact. And I, I believe with all my heart that people will have a God of some sort. You'll have a God of some sort. And as a Christian, our Heavenly Father demands that position in our life, to be number one in our life. Uh, so I want to look at some things tonight. And these are very simple facts. I want you to look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 again, and this is our text verse. The first thing I want you to see that God has a requirement. And what is the requirement? It's very, very simple, and it's in that verse. What does it say? Thou shalt have what? No other gods before me. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14. Slip over there and look, and it repeats that same basic principle and we're talking about the Ten Commandments. This is important. God gave this to the children of Israel that they would have a, a path and a course to follow of how to live to be pleasing unto God. And we know what Israel did over and over again. What did they do? They'd walk with God. They'd put God number one. And next thing you know, they'd get backslidden. They'd go down. God would bring judgment, bring them back up. We don't have to go through that in life. If we'll just take and put him number one in our life. Look at Exodus 34, 14. Again, it says it. For thou shalt worship what? No other. no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. I wonder in here tonight, has anybody ever been jealous? Uh, jealousy can cause problems, amen? And especially if God is jealous. That's a serious thing. He's jealous. He wants to be number one. And I think about how God has not asked or requested us to make him number one. It's, it's not a, a request on God's part, but he demands first place in our lives if we're going to please him. If we say we're saved and we put God on the back burner, do you think he's pleased with us? Absolutely not. Where's everybody tonight? You hear me say it all the time. In evangelism, we'd have the revival meetings. You'd start on Sunday. The house would be full. Then during the week, there wouldn't be as many. Where is everybody that's not working, not sick, and in a hospital and's not dead? I wonder, could it be that he's not number one? Now, you say that's brutal, but I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm trying to be honest. 
I think our churches ought to be full. If people are not sick, they're not working in the hospital, they ought to be in the house of God to hear the preaching, the teaching of the Word of God, and not only that, for the fellowship of believers. Amen. Amen. And there are a lot of false gods, but there's only one true God. Many false. I thought, I looked this up today. We, when we were in Casper, we, we had a, a family that went to Taiwan. And we supported them for all the years I was there, and they came back on furlough. And I'll never forget what they said. In Taiwan, they have God stores. You say, what do you mean? You go in there, and they have these pictures and these deities. There's just, And I looked it up today. How many gods did they estimate the Taiwan, people of Taiwan worship? 36,000 is what it said on the Internet. Uh, estimated 36,000 different gods. And they said when you go and you witness to a man, automatically they want to accept what you're saying because that's one more God they can add to their list. But there is only one God. Amen. That's bottom line. Amen. Uh, man's God is that person or thing, these different things, is most precious to him. What's the most precious thing in your life tonight? Ask yourself that. You better be careful because it may be your God. Or, or this, uh, the thing you will sacrifice the most for. Getting real quiet because, see, that's where we live. And we don't normally think about this. Or your God is that thing that moves your heart. Or your God is that thing, if you lose it, leaves you the most devastated. What happened in the 1929 collapse? Why did people take their lives? What did they lose? Yeah, they lost their fortunes. Here's a quote that Martin Luther made. He says, whatever we make the most of is our God. So ask yourself tonight, what is, what is it that I put the most emphasis on? What is it if I lose it, I'm devastated the most? You know, it ought to be. It ought to be God. If we don't have fellowship daily with God, that ought to be devastating to us. But I wonder if that's the situation. And all men are religious. You, now, you say religion. Let me give you a, a secular definition of religion. A pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. Mankind will find something or somebody to worship. And that's a fact. And it may not be God. Uh, here's, here's some different ones that people worship. Some men and women worship the God of pleasure. They put the supreme importance on pleasure. Look at today where we live in society. You drive down the streets in the average city out in the country, and I'm not against these things, don't get me wrong, but when you put that as a supreme importance in your life, it becomes a God. You drive down the road, and, and here's a gorgeous house with a beautiful yard. That's nice. But if somebody misses church and will not live for the Lord, and they take care of their yard and their house more than they think of the things of God, that's an idol. Or you drive down the road and you see somebody that's got two or three cars in the yard and they got uh, antique cars and they're on Sunday, they're polishing the car. They got a boat and they're at the lake with the boat instead of being in church. You know what that just became? That became the God. Look at, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 4. And this is speaking about the last days in 2 Timothy. And I, we were talking tonight, Scott back there, we were visiting a little bit, and I said, you know what's going on right now and all that's transpiring? It's nothing more than the last days. But look what it says about the last days in verse number 4. It says, there will be traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of what? And what's the last part? Lovers of pleasure more than what? Lovers of God. Titus chapter 3, this is a very interesting verse, and one of the words especially Titus chapter 3, and look at verse number 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 3. It says, For we ourselves also were sometime foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and what? Pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Look at the word serving. You ought to circle it right beside this definition. In the context, right there in that verse, that word serving means being a slave to or in bondage to. Think about what it says then. Uh, being in slavery to lust and pleasures. Hey, if that's the case, do you know what pleasures become to you? 
It's become a God. And we need to be very careful. There's nothing wrong with having activities, but we can never let anything taste the place of God or step in and, and override what we, we need to do for Him. Pleasure, it's addictive just like a drug. The, the more you have, guess what? The more you need to get to be satisfied. Now look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. Some people worship the God of pleasure, but here's the other. We talked about this a moment ago. But some also worship the God of possessions. And they put a supreme importance on their possessions. I, I like what I hear some people say, and they're in our church right here. They'll say, you know what? What I got is not mine. It belongs to God. Amen. That's the way it ought to be. Because who allows us to have what we've got? Who gives us our houses? Who gives us our, our vehicles? Who gives us everything we have? You say, well, I work for it. Yeah, but who gave you the ability? Who gave you the strength? God did. Yes. Amen. But look there at chapter 6 and verse 24. It says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve what? God and mammon. The definition of that mammon right there is money and possessions. Look over at Luke chapter 16. I love right here, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were who? They were the religious of the time. They were supposed to be the spiritual. But look at verse number 13, and I'm going to tell you what, he cut them to the heart when he said what he did. And in verse 13 it says, No servant can serve two masters, for either will hate the one, and love the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now notice the response of the Pharisees. And I think this is a response of a lot of Christians. Hey, I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me that. It's none of your business. Well, listen, the Word of God is my business. And my business to preach the Word of God in truth. Look what it goes on to say. And the Pharisees also who were what? What were they covetous of? God? Were they coveting God? Were they coveting the power of God? No, they were coveting the things of mammon. And then it goes on, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. That word deride means they spoke and acted with contempt towards God Almighty, the Lord Jesus. But then, I, I've always said this, if, if the Lord Jesus walked through those back doors today, everybody in here's eyes would fall right here on your front of your face. Because the, the pictures and the artists, they, they paint him up as this thin, anemic-looking guy with long, scraggly hair and a beard. If he walked through those doors tonight, you'd see a man's man. I believe he had broad shoulders. I believe he was a man that, that you would look at and you would respect for who he was. Not just because he was God, but he was a man. And I think he was a man because of how he responded to the Pharisees. Look what he said. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before man. And how many times is that what we try to do? We do what we do. We don't put God number one. We try to justify it in our lives. And, and you know, it doesn't cut it with God. It doesn't. And he goes on. He said, justify yourselves before man, but God knoweth your hearts. And, and for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Oh, my goodness. When we're more concerned about the possessions and the money and we're, quote, saying we love the Lord, listen, that's an abomination to God. It's a lie. And we've made the possessions, we've made the, the money, the things in our life, we've made those our gods, and that is not what the Lord wants. And, you know, most of the time we don't think about this, but uh, we can become idolaters, and we can do it very easily. I think of a man we had on our church in Hayden, Colorado. And some of you heard me tell this story, but I called him Smiley because he always smiled. I mean, he was a deacon in the church, and he, he always smiled. Oh, I, you wanted to peel the smile off his face. You really did. Just rip it right off. He worked at the coal mine, or he worked at the powerhouse where they delivered the coal from the mines to. He worked at the powerhouse. He, he had the highest pay wage. He got overtime when he wanted it. Pastor preached on making church a priority, and that man had an opportunity to go on night shift to get 10% more than he was making, meaning he'd miss Sunday night and he would miss Wednesday night. Pastor talked to him about it. He said, you make a wonderful living. His family was all in church. You know what that guy did? He took that night job for 10% more. What's that on $26, $2.60? 
But you know what happened? The smile was gone. No longer did he smile. No more did he have that joy. And not only that, because he wasn't in church Sunday and Wednesday because of job, he lost his family. I could tell the story about his family. That's a tragic thing. Why? Because he took something and he made it an idol, a God in his life, and that was the money and the possessions. When we trust and rely on money and possessions more than the Lord, that's idol worship. It's wrong. Look now, if you would, also at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. Some people worship the God of pleasure, some of possessions, but then there's also those that worship the God of personal worth. Whoa! You say, now you quit preaching and went to meddling. No. How many people are more concerned about self than they are pleasing God? Look there at, at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. It says, for men shall be, what's the next part? Lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parent, unthankful. You know, it's a, it's a bad thing when you elevate yourself above the things of God. That you're more important. What you want, what your desires, what the flesh says to you is more important what the Word of God says or what the Lord would have you do with your life. Amen. I've always said this, the worst enemy we got is not the devil. It's this person right here. And a lot of people will do that. They're more concerned about building self-esteem and they don't care what they have to do to get that self-esteem. I think about King Saul. Do you remember when, when Israel said, we want a king to rule over us like the nations around us? And God sent Samuel to anoint Saul, and at that time he didn't know who it was going to be, but it ended up being Saul. And you remember in the very beginning, he was very humble, he was very meek, he was more concerned about other people than he was himself. I remember the situation where they lost the livestock and they were out looking, and he was concerned that his father would be worried that they're not back yet. But it didn't take very long when David came along and they went out to battle and they came back and they said Saul has killed his thousand and David has killed his what? Ten thousands. What happened to Saul after that? Saul wasn't the same guy because you know who was on the throne of his life? It wasn't God Almighty, but it was Saul. And it destroyed him. If you follow through and you see the end of it, uh, he was destroyed, but not only himself, but his boys with him and the army. I'm telling you, this thing of personal worth is a serious thing. And there's a lot of people that they're more concerned about self and what people think of them than what they think about God. But then look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. Here's another one. Boy, I've been guilty of this over the years, and I try not to do it anymore. Work is a bad thing. You're all supposed to laugh at that. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You say, now where is that going? I think that some people worship the God of plans and projects. The flesh says, i got to do this. I, I have to have this. And we get started on something, a project or a plan. And you know what we do? We sidetrack our Bible reading. We sidetrack our our prayer time. We sidetrack our our witnessing. We sidetrack maybe even going to church. You don't make Sunday school because you got a project going that you just got to finish. Amen. My wife used to say to me at night, I was building that airplane. She shut it off, big boy. Shut it off. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I can hear your gears and your brain grinding right now thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow. We better be careful about our plans and projects. You say, well, I got this plan and this project going and I'm probably going to miss church sometime. Ah, you better watch out. Or you say, well, I got to get an early start on this project or this plan because it's going to be hot and I want to do it early in the morning. But that's your prayer time, your Bible reading time. Better be careful. You say, all of this has got to do with God being number one. It's got everything to do with it because these things take the place of our God. Amen. Anything that occupies our mind more and is more of a supreme importance than God has become an idol. Or it's become our God. And that's serious. Okay, so that was number one. Let's look at number two. 
Number one was God's requirement. It was very simple. He is to be what? Number one. That, well, that wasn't hard. Anybody could say that. Okay, number two is God's reason for the requirement. And it's also pretty simple, too. He alone paid the price. Amen. Amen? Look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2 again. And it says right there, it, it describes it right in black and white. It says in verse number 2 of Exodus chapter 20, it says, I am the Lord thy God, which have, what's the next word? Brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You know what? He's the one that paid the price. He's the one that's gone to all the trouble. By the way, when we read that in Exodus, it's speaking sp expressly about who? Israel. And this is what he had done for Israel. Look at these different facts about Israel and how God paid the price. In Psalm 74 and verse 2, look over there if you would. Psalm 74 and verse number 2. First thing is, God alone paid the price. He purchased Israel. He's the one that purchased Israel in the very beginning. In chapter 74 and verse 2, it says, Remember thy congregation. Now notice these next words. What does it say? Which thou hast... Huh? Purchased of old. Yeah, boy, that was real quiet. Is everybody there? I see these girls right here. I go too fast, and they just gave up turning. Amen? But anyway, it says, Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. But he purchased Israel. Israel has a responsibility. They have an obligation to God. But you know what? They didn't fulfill that all the time. Uh, here's another. He also chose Israel above everybody else. In Deuteronomy 4 and verse 37, it says, And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt. Again, he chose Israel above everybody else. Uh, were they big? Were they important? Were they smart? What was it? No, it was because he loved them. Amen? Deuteronomy 10, 15, it says, only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above, listen to this, all people as it is this day. Now, why in the world should Israel obey? Because God's paid the price. God's made it possible. He's the one that purchased them. He's the one that chose them above everybody else. And then also we saw in that verse, but it's in this verse as well, it was also because he loved Israel. I think about this, if somebody loves you like God loved them and loves us, how can we not put them number one? And especially when we see all that He has done for us and He's willing to do even in the future. And in Deuteronomy chapter 10, or excuse me, 2 Chronicles 2 and verse 11, Then Huram, the king of Tyre, answered in writing, which he sent to Solomon. He said, Because the Lord hath loved His people, He hath made thee king over them. And again, I'm talking about the things that God had done and why his request to be number one was legitimate. It was fair. It was right. And then I think also in Exodus 18 and verse 8, God also delivered Israel. Think of how many times he delivered them over and over and over again. In verse 8, it says, And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. My goodness, you think of being in captivity in Egypt all those years? And what did he do? He came in and did the impossible. He set, what, two or three million people free to go back to worship him? And then also Isaiah 61, 9, After their seed shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people, all that see them shall acknowledge them, and they are, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. Oh, my goodness. I think Israel, without a doubt, owed God. They owed their absolute reverence and worship to God for what he had done. But you know what is the old saying? Out of sight is what? How often does that happen with us? I mean, we have the blessings of God, and we're walking down the road of life. We got the blessings. The next thing you know, you forget where the blessings come from. Amen. I think that's the, the serious problem with Israel today. Israel does not realize where the blessing and the victory comes from. Although I saw here recently they had some of the hostages that were released, and one was a young lady, 
And I was excited to hear what she said. When I was in captivity, uh, she had been hit in the arm. Her arm was partially blown off. Uh, the hostages, that, or the, the people that took them hostage, actually repaired her arm somewhat. But her words were this. She said, I prayed over and over again that the IDF would come. No, that's not what she said. She said, I prayed over and over again that God would come and they would save me. They would get me out of here. I thought, amen, there's at least one that realized the only one that could get them out, and that was God. But then I want you to look at John chapter 1, and verse 14. You and I as Christians must never forget what Christ has done for us. And you say, well, what's that got to do with the Ten Commandments? Just as Israel, I believe, had an obligation to worship and serve God because of all he's done, you and I have the same responsibility to put him number one. I always think of how the Lord Jesus left heaven. I can't imagine that. He left heaven, the crown of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that robe he set it aside, and he came to this earth in the form of sinful man. But he never sinned once the whole time he was here. Why would you do that? Most everybody in this building would never think about dying for the person sitting next to you. But he did. And he wasn't just another man. He was God himself. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 14. I think of how he left the glories of heaven just for you and I. And the word was made what? Flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Boy, Christ left the glories of heaven just for you and I. How can we not make him number one? And then I think also look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 20. Christ endured poverty and hardship for you and I. My goodness, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And how was he raised? He was raised basically in, in poverty. He was raised in a carpenter's house. He didn't have the luxuries that probably the royalty had. He did not have that. But Matthew chapter 8 and verse 20, it says, And Jesus saith unto, unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, what? hath not where to lay his head. That's the king of kings. That's the Lord of lords. He didn't even have what a fox had. He didn't even have what uh, the poor had to lay their head upon. And why did he do it? He did it for you and I. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9. I love this verse. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for whose sake? Your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And it wasn't financial riches, it was spiritual riches. If he had not come, if he had not uh, bled and died on that cross, you and I would be poor spiritually, we would die, and we'd burn forever. And I think of how that he was rejected by those he came to save. I mean, the Jews turned their back on him. They said, crucify him. I think of how they scourged him. And again, how many of you have ever seen the movie The Passion? I've never seen the whole thing. But I saw the section where they scourged him. That's worth anybody seeing. I mean, they took him and they beat him with that cat of nine tails until his body was nothing but a bloody mess. You say, oh, do you think that's real? I believe every bit of it. And it was probably more than they could depict on that movie. But he didn't do that for something he'd done. He did it for you and I. We should have been the one that had the beating. I think about, and every time I read it in the New Testament, as you get over towards the, the crucifixion where it says they spit in his face, I, get, I tremble when I think about that. Somebody spitting in the, the face of the Son of God, how horrible that is. And they mocked him and they ridiculed him. They smote him on the face. They plucked his beard out. And when they nailed him to the cross, you know, they had this loincloth on, but when they nailed him to the cross, they were naked. They were naked to the shame of the world. And who did he do that for? He did that for you and I. Amen. And then they crucified him. I can't, even, I can't even fathom it. Taking those nails and driving them through the, the hands and the feet. And then the, the pain of that death on the cross. He died the most cruel, painful death. He died of suffocation. And why did he do it? He did it for you and I that he might ransom us from the penalty of sin. My goodness. And I think of, in spite of all he was wrongfully suffered, he still loves us unconditionally. 
He's willing to receive us. He's willing to save us. And you know what? He's willing to keep us and always be there. How, how can you not put him number one? I think God has a, all the right in the world to demand of us 100% loyalty and faithfulness to him. But in the third thing I want to give you, and I want to just leave this with you to think about, God had requirement. It was very simple. He is to be number one. And the reason it was simple, too, because he paid the price. But the third thing is all people have a choice. You have a choice either to rebel or comply. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, if a lost person hears the gospel of Jesus Christ and they say, no, that's rebelling. And do you know what their prize or their reward for rebellion will be? One day it'll be an eternal home in a lake of fire. Uh, they'll be conscious. They'll never die. And it's an eternity of torment and punishment. I don't know about you. I wouldn't want to have that. But you say, what about the saved person? Well, saved people can rebel too. You can get saved and truly be born again, but you can rebel in the fact that you're not going to put him number one in your life and you're going to follow what is pleasing unto him. And what, what is the consequence there? Uh, well, let me read it to you. In Hebrews chapter 5, and this, this I don't think people take seriously. It says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. If we are saved and we are not living for God and we're in sin, I believe God gives us an opportunity to repent. But if we will not repent on our own, I believe God brings about the situations that will bring us to our knees. I remember when I ran from God, I thought I had it all. Even after I got electrocuted, that 8,500 volts that went through my body, I still ran for 13 more months. But you know what God had to do? God had to bring me so low, so low to the ground, the only thing I could do is look up. You say he wouldn't do that. He does do that because we are his children. It says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Not just one or two. It says, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? By you say, well, that's not me, then, then you're not saved. Because that says he'll chasten any child of his. It says, but if you be without chastisement, whereof, there's that little word you ought to circle, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. That's a curse word today, but it means illegitimate or imitator. If you say you're saved and you're in sin and you don't confess that sin and you don't get your heart right, sooner or later God's going to chasten you. And if you don't have any chastisement in your life, then you might just check it out that you've never been saved. You're not one of his children. That's like you go over to somebody's house and their kids are acting up. You're going to go over and whip that child? No, you don't have any concern about that. But if your child does it, you don't want that child to disobey. You want them to do right. You're going to discipline them some way. And God's the same way. And then verse 9, it goes on and says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. How many of you ever got a licking from your daddy and you respected him for it? Amen. Wow. But you know what? The Lord got, brings about chastisement, and people will still pursue and go on in the wrong way. They have no respect for God. It says, Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our what? Profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. What God does to us, folks, is only for the betterment of our lives. And it says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. I never got a licking that I clapped my hands and said, Amen! Now you didn't either. <laughs> but grievous, nevertheless, Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We may not like the chastening, but that's a consequence for the child of God that rebels and will not put God number one. But then the second one is saved and lost alike can comply. And that's the good part. 
You say, what happens if a lost person complies? They receive forgiveness and salvation. And you know what? They establish a home in heaven that they can spend eternity in. And I think also about the Christian when a Christian is backslidden or you know there's things that are not right in your life and, and you've put God on the back burner and you realize what you've done and you confess it, you forsake it, and you put him back number one in your life, do you know what that brings to you? That brings blessings. I think about Psalm 51 and verse 9 to verse 12. Here's what the psalmist said. He said, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now listen to this. Restore unto me the what? Joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. I wonder tonight, who's number one in your life? Is the Lord number one, or is there something else that's taking his place? The Ten Commandments are very relevant today, and especially for you and I that are saved it's a guideline to live a life that's pleasing to God. And the way we do that is by putting him number one. Let's bow our heads, please. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder tonight if there might be one. I promise the Lord I'd never preach or give an invitation that I didn't offer an opportunity for somebody to get saved. I wonder tonight if there might be one in here. You say, if I were to die right now... Not sure I'm going to heaven. I know this. I do not want to die and go to a lake of fire for eternity. Anybody like that tonight? Anybody at all? I wonder how many would be honest tonight. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take some integrity. Nothing impairing you from being honest with God. I wonder how many tonight that say God is not number one in my life the way he should be. And I know it. There are things that are interfering that are taking away from him being number one, and I realize that tonight, and I want to do something about it. My prayer tonight is this, that I would make sure that God is number one in my life. How many of that would be your prayer tonight? Let me see your hand slip it up high. Amen. Father, thank you tonight for our folks. Thank you for their honesty, and I do pray tonight, Father, that you would bless this invitation. Lord, help us not to just hear the word of God, walk out, and Put it aside, but I pray that we would apply what we hear in our lives, that we can be a people, children that are pleasing to our Heavenly Father. Bless tonight, Father, this invitation, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed.